A warm welcome to everyone. Uh, on behalf of Azim Premji University, I am Shashwat DC, and I welcome you all to another to, to another uh, series of, of you know another series of nature in our cities. And I welcome you all to so, another. Uh, Yes, so that was a little bit of eco thing happening here. Yes, so today, uh, Nature in Our Cities is a series where we talk about the animals that live in close proximity of our cities and they, you know, live uh, right no, uh, next door to us. And over the past couple of months, we have highlighted numerous of such, uh, you know, uh, uh, animals and species that, that, that uh, abound all around us through this series. Uh, some of the, if you remember some of the animals that we spoke about, the Madras hedgehog we spoke about, we spoke about spiders, we spoke about leopards. And today uh, we are speaking about a species which is very close to my heart per se. It is monkeys or macaques. Uh, let me also admit on a personal note, I'm a big monkey fan. Uh, I, my, I hail from a place called as Varanasi, where as a child I spent many summers, you know, and in, in Varanasi, you had this whole, the whole city is abounds with monkeys per se. And I spent many summers being scared, fascinated, observing them. You know, even at the temple, I remember at Sankat Motion, there we used to be so many of them. And we used to, you know, kind of interact with them and engage with them. But one thing I've realized, and this is something which has, you know, kind of hit me hard is we know so little about them per se. And especially in putting this program together, I also realized that so many of us, Kind of, you know, they, they, we take them for granted per se. You know, we know much about tigers. We pay attention to the rhinos. The elephants are, of course, there. And yes, there are very pertinent issues. But, you know, since the monkeys are so many numerous and all around us, it's more of like, you know, ghar ki mulki, dal balabar kind of a thing. They are not threatened, so we don't care. But what is the actual scenario with them? What are the challenges? And most importantly, how, what are these monkeys and these macaques, these species, there's so many of them, how, why don't we know about them? So to do that today, we have a very special guest who's also a renowned primatologist and in the Rana Sinha, he's called as Rana per se. And he's, he's an expert on primates and he will be taking us through the whole journey of, you know, monkeys. He's, he has spent over two decades now studying monkeys all across India and especially in a, in a very uh, major project that he that has been you know conducting in the Pandipur uh, reserve. So Anandya Rana Sinha is uh, primarily a professor with the National Institute of Advanced Studies in Bangalore and has early research interest in molecular biochemistry of yeast metabolism. He has studied social biology of VAUS, the classical genetics of human disease and although his primary principal research over the three decades has been on behavioral ecology, cognitive eth ethology, population, and behavioral genetics. You know, he has his his whole repertoire has been. He's known as the uh, you know primate specialist in India. So welcome on board, uh, uh, Anindya. It's a great pleasure having you here. Thank you very much, Ashwat. Uh, very kind of you. A very kind of Azim Prem University to invite me, and it's wonderful to be here. Um, and uh, so to share my love for macaques, as you said, um, uh, with uh, an audience with whom I hope to engage with in some discussion about the monkeys around us, what kind of lives they have and where the future perhaps lies. And I would, of course, uh, like this to be a discussion, but maybe if you um, allow me, I will spend maybe just a few, uh, maybe a half an hour to just talk a bit about uh, my work to set it on stage and uh, perhaps then we can open it up for discussion. Would that be all right? So, Wonderful. Yeah, please yeah. share. So could I sh share my slides? Right. Um, is it visible? Shashwa? Yes, it is visible. Yes. Great. So um, uh, I have called it the monkey in the mirror. And the reason why I've done that is because uh, I, I, it's a quote from a very famous uh, humorist who once said, well, I don't think he was a very famous humorist because not too many people know him, but uh, he once said that uh, the difference between man and monkey is this, that when a monkey stands in front of a mirror, he sees a monkey. 
And I thought that was extremely profound and it's something that I've always enjoyed. And I think in a way I've called it the monkey in the mirror because through the macaques that I'm, we are going to discuss today, I think there are reflections on our own lives and how we uh, are dealing with the environment around us, uh, how we are in many cases destroying the environment around us and putting a threat not only the lives of the macaques, the lives of all other species, but ours as well. And hopefully there will be some discussion about this as we go along. Uh, let me start with a very brief uh, introduction to the Indian primates. India actually is home to a very large number of primate species. And if you look at this chart here, you will see, if you look at the family, there are basically three kinds of primates which are predominantly present across the world. And we have representatives of all three of them in our country as well. Right at the top are what are called the Loricidae, the Lorises. These are very uh, primitive in, in the sense of being evolutionally ancient, not primitive in any other way, but they originated far be, uh, earlier than us. Uh, they are nocturnal, they are solitary, though the beginnings of sociality seems to show up in them. And we have the slender loris in South India, uh, which is found only in Southern India and Sri Lanka. And we have the slow loris in Northeast India, which extends into Southeast Asia as well. The next major group of primates are what are called the Cercopithecidae. And they have two major groups, the Cercopithecini and the Colobini. Now, the Cercopithecini are typically uh, omnivorous, and these are the macaques, right? So if you look at the rhesus monkey of North India, the bonnet monkey of South India, these are the most common ones. These represent the Cercopithecini, and uh, this is really the largest group of primates, non-human primates that you see anywhere in the world. In fact, if you look at the macaques, and I have listed eight species that we have in India, there is a potentially a ninth one, uh, the white-cheeked macaque, which I haven't talked about. There's been just a couple of reports in Arunachal Pradesh about it. If you look at the macaques, they are actually the largest genus of non-human primates. And if you look at distribution of the macaques, they go right from Afghanistan in the West to Japan in the east with one species in northern Africa. So other than humans, they are the most widely distributed of all primates. Within the Cercopithecidae, you also have the leaf monkeys or the Colobini represented by the langurs, right? And these are again very common. Shashwat referred to them uh, when he was talking about Varanasi. And finally, we have the apes. Now, typically, you have the smaller apes and the greater apes, the great apes, right? I'm sure all of you know that we are a member of the great ape group, right? You have the uh, the orangutan, you have the uh, gorilla, the chimpanzee, the bonobo, and then the humans. These are the five species of the great apes. But the smaller apes are what are called the gibbons, right? And we have one species of gibbon, a hulog gibbon, uh, in Northeast India, which again extends in distribution into Southeast Asia. So this is just to give you an idea how, how rich our biodiversity is with regard to primates. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's quite incredible that uh, in 2005, which is just 15 years ago, uh, some of us reported the Arunachal macaque, which you see here uh, listed amongst the macaques, uh, from Arunachal Pradesh. And this was, uh, whether it's a new species or not, is a, a diff difficult question. However, it is a new taxon to science. And this was reported in 2015, which just tells you that how incredibly variable the macaques are in terms of their ecological distribution, in terms of their social liability, in terms of how behaviorally flexible they are. And the macaques really make for extremely interesting species to study also in our efforts to understand ourselves. And therefore, let me go to a group of three of these macaques, which are most common. You see the rhesus macaque all over North India. You see the bonnet macaque all over South India. In fact, the bonnet macaque is endemic to South India. And you only find it here in peninsular India. And you have the long-tailed macaque, uh, which is found in the Nicobar Islands. Right? It's, it's one of the subspecies which is found only in the Nicobar Islands. The other subspecies are found in Southeast Asia. Now, what is fascinating about these three macaques is they have been called by Richard et al., uh, uh, scientific uh, colleagues of ours, 
the weed macaques. And the reason why they are called weed macaques is because they are remarkably capable of adapting to almost any kind of environment, which could be natural, it could be human dominated. You find them in the rainforests, you find them in the scrub jungles, you find them virtually in every Indian city and town. What's also fascinating is that the so-called naturally occurring populations or groups of these three species tend to move towards human habitations and they start living on the ground rather than staying up in the trees. And this tendency seems to be almost innate. It's almost genetic. And we can perhaps discuss this more uh, during uh, the later discussion session. What also is very fascinating about these three species, and this separates them from the 19 or 20 other macaques that they are closely related to, is that they have a very different kind of life history. What does that mean? It means that they uh, usually these individuals of these three species mature much more rapidly than do their other macaque individuals. They tend to uh, start breeding very soon. The interbirth interval between two successive young is shorter. And it therefore seems that their entire life history tends towards reproduction. And they will they have typically a young every year. As opposed to this, you have all the other macaques, which are also known as the broadleaf forest macaques, which even if they interact with humans, tend to be much shyer than to stay more in their natural habitats. And their investment over their lives is more into individual development. So they have fewer young over their lifetimes. They spend a lot more time bringing up their young. And in some sense, they are perhaps more reminiscent of humans. We have very few offspring over our lifetimes, but each offspring is given lavish attention, right? And so the other macaques, other than these three weed macaques, tend to follow very similar life history strategies, but the weed macaques stand out for having a completely different way of leading their lives, which is based on reproduction and producing more of their own. And therefore, uh, let me talk today about two of these species, the rhesus monkey and the bonnet monkey, uh, because that's those are the two species that are really the urban macaques in our country today. And let me also tell you in passing that the way these two species have adapted to humans within our uh, cities, our towns, our villages is unparalleled is unparalleled not only across Southeast Asia or in other parts of Asia, but anywhere in the world. In no other country do macaques or primates, non-human primates, live with so much uh, closeness to humans as these two species are. <clears throat> and the reason why this has been possible is because of two reasons. The first, I think Indian classic thought very differently from Western philosophy, has always believed in a continuum across species. So all non-human species are related to us, is a very deep belief that has been held over generations, over in traditions. This is different because the human non-human divide is far more prominent in other philosophies, but primarily that of the West. And therefore, since Western philosophy has influenced our modern day science much more than our Indian traditional systems, we have had to wait to rediscover Darwin, who first amongst the Western thinkers spoke about the continuity across species. But let me just tell you that this is something we had discovered a long, long time ago. It's a philosophical way of living where we consider all other uh, species to be our relatives. And this has extremely important implications for our conservation ethos. But then that's another story. The second reason, of course, is that traditionally we have held many of these non-human primates uh, fairly. We've given them a pedestal in our own religion, in our uh, spiritual thinking. And therefore, uh, we find that we there is a tendency to respect uh, the the lives of other non-human primates simply because of this association in the case of the rhesus macaque, for example, or the bonnet, bonnet macaque with Hanuman or Sugriva or Bali or all the, uh, the mythical uh, figures of the Ramayana with whom we associate these species. Of late, however, uh, we have been experiencing, as, and I'm sure all of you know, that 
or a spirit of uh, the spirit of coexistence is being threatened and part of this is because of the drastic reduction and fragmentation of our natural resources which is leading to immense competition between the species for the very meager resources that we have and leading to decline in many of these natural ecosystems so much so that many of these species now have to move to typically human habitations where they have to coexist with us today however uh, let me speak mainly about uh, the our uh, cities uh, talking about the rhesus macaque and bonnet macaque in our cities though occasionally i will return back to my beloved bandipur national park where we originally began to study what we call the synerbization of the macaques which literally means how they are becoming urbanized thanks to their interactions with humans and our influence on them which i will discuss they are urban they are becoming more and more urban and this i think is a immensely clear if any of you travel through many of these highways that run across these forests because there you see that these highways rudely disrupt the forest and from there where the macaques come out into the highway they slowly start moving and as they've done in bandipur to the various human habitations and the agricultural fields that dot the periphery of the forests the macaques are coming into town Right. Now, urbanization, of course, is uh, one of the uh, major problems uh, that uh, is a major challenge that India and several other nations of the global south typically will have to confront in this century. And urban poverty, of course, is perhaps on the rise. And one of the most important factors that seems to be promoting poverty is the rapid urbanization, which is outstripping most cities' uh, capacities to actually um, a develop adequate infrastructure to for their teeming millions. In this connection, a very neglected uh, dimension of urban governance really concerns non-human mammalian and bird life in our cities. <clears throat> Let us take New Delhi as an example, right? New Delhi has about 12,000 stray cattle, 400,000 feral dogs, 9,000 wild monkeys. And this is a situation that is very similar across many Indian cities of today. Cattle provide opportunities for the poor to deal with their urban precarity, but they come into contestations over access to the city. Stray dogs and monkeys generate conflict by disrupting everyday life and posing significant health risks, more of which we will discuss uh, later uh, today. Although this is a major contemporary governance challenge, adequate frameworks that allow us to understand human-animal relations and to design effective policies to manage potential conflict is seriously lacking in urban India, right? Now, through an, a very extensive collaboration that I have developed with a very close friend of mine, Dr. Man Borua, who's an ethnogeographer from Cambridge University, uh, we hope to attract attention to certain aspects of animal urbanization the experiences that shape non-human life worlds, both in the wild, where the process begins, as well as in the city. And this is an appeal to actually animate, in some sense, if I may use the term, current urban thought. Drawing upon my ongoing work with both bonnet macaques and Asian elephants in southern India, we hope to understand what living in these rapidly urbanizing environments might actually mean to non-human individuals and populations and reflect on the opportunities that some of these ethogeographical explorations and conversations may offer for our understanding of the urban ecologies of the future, right? especially across the cities of the global south. Now, we argue that part of the reason, the part of the reason why we have failed to understand human animal relations in the urban, in our cities, stems from a paucity of conversations, stems from a lack of conversation between the ecological and the social sciences and the lack of collaborative insights to inform urban policy. To this end, we have identified three broad areas of interdisciplinary thinking, which is likely to have direct bearings on how Indian cities might be 
perhaps better governed in the future? The first pertains to understanding urban metabolism. And what do I mean by metabolism? This is the new ecology of non-human life, which is configured to the availability of food and waste. If you look across a whole range of city uh, species that live with us, you will see that their connections to us remains largely embedded in the relationship of food and waste, food that we consume or they consume and the waste that they or we generate, right? The second, uh, the second uh, pertains to the question of space. And this is the diverse ways in which animals territorialize, transgress, and unsettle urban orders. The third, and this, of course, is the one that seems to be most uh, prevalent and the most familiar to us, is that of politics, which emerges through conflicts between people, animals, the state, and the various institutions that govern these. We propose to address this trilogy through eco-geographical studies of macaques, black kites, feral pigs, cows, and street dogs, highlighting their importance for understanding three facets of urban governance. And I'll touch upon all of them very briefly later today. Access to the city, to who does the city really belong? Second, livelihoods. Do these animals help us in our livelihoods? Do they take away from our livelihoods? And third, public health. And in this process, we highlight the critical importance of such interdisciplinary conversations for a much wider rethinking of who poses the actual challenges and what constitutes the urban in contemporary India. Urbanization thus becomes a process that transforms nature into novel nature-society hybrids. And nowhere is this better exemplified than the ubiquitous urban macaques that live integrally in virtually every city and every town of the Indian subcontinent. Too sentient to be animal, yet too other to be human, too sacred to be killed, yet too rambunctious to be accommodated. They are provisioned by people, they are relegated by the state, India's urban macaques are commensal creatures par excellence. They cohabit comfortably with people, but also unsettle our rhythms of the everyday, and they pose serious public health and governance concerns. Let me first turn very briefly again to our first concern that or uh, of the metabolic flows when we in within which we examine processes of urbanization tracking how metabolization results in transformation of macaque life worlds and how our shared histories are constituted and sensed by both people and macaques the commensal ecologies that urban metabolization fuels are primarily shaped by the city's human driven metabolic flows their intensities, and often the urban citizens' practices of sharing food with macaques. Being messmates, company who eat at the same table, and remember, when we say commensal, it comes from this idea that the macaques and humans share the same food resources, so we are, in some sense, messmates. We eat at the same table. This lies at the heart of our relationship. Food actually becomes a point where the mutual interests of macaques and people overlap, a convergence that is simultaneously material, semiotic, and affective, reconfiguring macaque ethologies, reconstituting their urban lives. Macaques are extremely adaptable individuals, and as our fieldwork suggests, they are able to alter their foraging strategies to access human origin foods, as well as devise devious methods to exploit human artifacts and objects for their survival. Right. Let me take you briefly back to Bandipur National Park, where the process of cyanobization of wild bonnet macaques have begun with interactions between the macaques, the visiting tourists, 
who regularly interact with and feed the monkeys and the fruit sellers whose livelihoods have now come to depend on the human macaque interactions. Raghavendra is an elderly banana seller who offers his fruits to visiting tourists at the Bandipur forest camp, largely to benefit the macaques who eagerly wait, arms outstretched for the bananas to be thrown to them by their laughing benefactors. It is also not uncommon for some daring individual macaques to try and grab a banana or two under the watchful eyes of Raghavendra, only to be deterred when he half-heartedly waves a long stout stick at them. And not once, however, has he struck anyone. He has never, ever hit any of the macaques. Small, who is a dominant adult male in one of the camps, Camp 2, that we've been studying for over 20 years now. And this individual, small, comes and sits quietly next to Raghavendra, almost in contact, but not even once looking at him or at the coveted bananas. No vocal or gestural signal is exchanged. Raghavendra picks up a banana and offers it to small, but does not look at him. Small takes the banana gently and moves away, once again not acknowledging the donation through any kind of visual or haptic gesture. He returns to Raghavendra a few hours later, and this mutually accepted interaction occurs again and again and again until darkness descends on the forest camp. Interspecies behavioral exchanges, such as that between Raghavendra and Small, can lead to the development of intensely personal relationships between individual macaques and humans, or what we call the generation of more than human, affective and, and immersive environments, but also, tragically, to the slow but steady synerbization of the macaque worlds. My colleagues and I have extensively tracked individual bonnet macaques or rhesus macaques that have now begun to move out of their natural forested habitats to dwell permanently in close proximity to humans, setting into motion processes of gradual habituation when they get used to each other and the development of relationships, which could be affective, which could be emotional, marked by both tolerance as well as friction between individuals of both the species. Let me now turn to the city once again. Provisioning, however, and provisioning is when food is offered to these macaques, provisioning has corporeal bearings upon uh, uh, on these urban macaques. Their bodies are affected. Certain rhesus macaque populations in Delhi, for example, have now developed a great fondness for junk food, packaged chips, ice cream, aerated drinks, and fried savouries. Provided for by people or obtained by snatching, our observations suggest that the processed food now constitutes as much as 90% of rhesus macaque diets in some parts of the city, especially where natural forage has become scarce. Urban macaques have also been reported to develop obesity, diabetes, and occasionally have higher levels of cholesterol than do their rural counterparts, conditions generally associated with urban human lifestyles. Readily available human source foods have also contributed to the recent surge in urban macaque populations across cities. Their numbers are definitely growing. Let me now turn to the idea of macaque spaces, right? asking how urban space mobilities and their associated politics might be conceptualized differently when animal movements and their territories are actually foregrounded, when we give importance to how they decide on establishing space for themselves. These forms of territorialization through which this, uh, they are subject to a lot of exclusion, right? Uh, Socio-spatial exclusion uh, in cities have laid emphasis how animals are practically affected as marginal social groups. They are polluting and disruptive occupants of the urban where humans alone 
have the authority to live and work, right? And commensality, the fact that we share space, that we share food, we share other resources with them, naturally then gives rise to what we have called an ecology of concern. We are concerned because don't forget, the macaques were perhaps here in many cases before we took over their forests to build our cities. Today, they have no option but to continue to live here, depend on us for their food resources. But they are, as I said, marginal social groups. They are polluting individuals they're disruptive occupants who destroy our livelihoods. In many cases, they destroy our lives. Now, in Delhi, commensality seems to have become a metropolitan concern or in at least four different arenas. First, everyday practices, right, including provisioning. In the everyday, people offer food to the macaques, but there are other ways in which we interact with them. These all contribute to not only the flourishing of the macaques, but this all give rise to frictions as well from their urban presence. Yet, the everyday is not about conflict alone. Here is another story from one of our respondents. A troop of rhesus macaques descends from the high rise of Connaught Place in central Delhi. Sliding down pipes, their adept movement becomes a series of silhouettes over shops selling sacred threads and bangles before turning into an undulation as the simians clamber across electric wires, casting shadows on astrologers and palmists, reading the fortunes of people many feet below. This vertical descent comes to a slow halt as the animals reach the tiled plaza in front of Delhi's iconic Hanuman temple, thronging with an evening crowd that has come to offer their prayers and alms to the needy. With a sure extension of its forearm, a macaque reaches out for a banana offered by Anuj, a devotee. A transaction and a trans-species action takes place, food for the simian and a harnessing of punya, a diffuse cleansing merit for the man. Anuj says, I come here every day, Tuesday, especially to feed monkeys. And he repeats the action and till his dozen bananas have been offered to a dozen macaques. From a lower middle class rural family in northern India, Anuj had come to Delhi over a decade ago in search of employment, but none of his appointments ever worked out. Unemployed, alone in the city, his condition deteriorated. Anuj began to lose hope, wishing to end his life. And I quote him, many times I thought of wanting to kill myself. I became skeptical, even angry with God for my predicament. Out of sheer desperation, Anuj enrolled into IT classes and began fasting every Tuesday when he would visit Connaught Place's Hanuman Temple to participate in rituals and also to feed the macaques. And I quote him again, this routine and interacting with the monkeys made me experience a deep transformation. Anuj's mental health gradually improved and he even managed to secure a position in a multinational company. All credit goes to them, he remarks, as he hands over the last fruit to an outstretched hand. These visits to the Hanuman temple have renewed my faith in life. This becoming urban of uh, the macaques has been fostered by our everyday practices of commensality. Delhi, in fact, as Anuj said, witnesses very large scale feeding of macaques from passers by, pa pausing to buy bananas from street vendors to the affluent middle class who bring food in cars, strewing large quantities of grams, vegetables, fruits by the pavement thronged by macaques. These are largely the actions of devotees wishing to receive merit or punya, or as in the case of Anuj, small acts of making sense of their own misfortune and to keep distress at bay. Provisioning and the sentient encounters between people and macaques have, in fact, also led to the emergence of what one might call affective economies. Economic arrangements that are dependent on this commensality and the bodily adjustments that 
humans and macaques seem to have made with each other. A number of banana vendors in Delhi today earn a living by selling bananas to devotees who in turn buy them only often to feed the macaques. Some of these vendors occasionally toss bananas to macaques to keep them in their vicinity and thereby attract customers. One vendor even regularly filled water in a well near his makeshift stall so as to attract the macaques so that they would invariably be present in the area. Here, the ultimate consumers of the commodities, in this case bananas, are of course the macaques. Their presence is vital for economic transactions to take grip and for value to be realized. And therefore, vendors actively cultivate relations with these sentient creatures. Human macaque encounters thus subtend economic activity and give a new meaning to what constitutes the economic in the urban sphere. Moving from the everyday to what next becomes important and uh, important concern for the state and its bureaucratic apparatus is the problem of regulating the number of macaques in the city. Not only that, we also want to curb street vendors. We want to curb stray dogs or macaque populations. And this have become the majoritarian strategies adopted to develop a Delhi of the future, envisioned as one of the bureaucrats told us, a modern, clean, and globalized capital. There is, however, significant political debate on this term commensal and wild, which I think has been modified for a range of political and bureaucratic ends. The Delhi Municipal Corporation, for example, argues that macaques are not stray animals, but wildlife. The management of their populations and habitat, the civic body maintains, is thus the responsibility of the state's forest department. In response, the forest department states that urban macaques have become commensal by nature. By having evolved, by adapting themselves to live close to human habitations, they can no longer be considered wildlife, the department says. The onus of regulating urban macaque population, they contend, is then on the civic body. Commensality and wildness thus become points of contention, sparking politics of urban governance in the face of macaques overtaking human action and rendering majoritarian logics futile. What is pragmatically more important to note, and I'm sure all of us have seen this, is that after decades of intervention, the menace continues to escalate. The so-called menace continues to escalate. Capture and relocation have been plagued by chronic bureaucracy, but more importantly, subverted by the behavior and actions of the macaques themselves. New troops have moved into territories evacuated by the captured monkeys. They have also learned to avoid traps, thus rendering all attempts at creating an animal-free global capital frustratingly futile. Third, Commensality becomes a concern through public health. Anthropogenic food landscapes where human source foods become important for all other wild species that we share our city with and their concomitant human interactions severely enhances intra-troop, that is within troop, competition, aggression with individual macaques competing strongly for attractive human provided foods. But what is more important is that they also start showing agonistic behavior towards people as well. Each year, over a thousand monkey bites are reported across Delhi. Such agonistic behavior towards people typically being contingent on the extent that food is offered to them, the nature of the foods and the way this food is distributed. Provisioning makes individual macaques less fearful. They become more bold and now relatively dominant individuals engage in aggressive encounters with people, often inflicting severe bites, especially on more vulnerable women and children. At least five cases of monkey bites are reported in Delhi each day, posing risks in the form of zoonotic pathogen transfers. Macaques can also harbor several other pathogens, including those responsible for hepatitis B and tuberculosis. Fourth, and finally, 
Delhi's urban macaques get entangled in debates on animal welfare. Welfare activists contend that the policies of rendering Delhi macaques free, Delhi, to make Delhi macaque free, have been, and I quote them, short sighted and heartless. Several complaints have been filed against civic administration officials and contractors to whom macaque capture has been outsourced for poor treatment of animals and for violating the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals 1960 Act. Attachments and obligations of animal welfare activists and certain members of the public, for that matter, often rubs up against those of the state. These ecologies of concern, as we've called them earlier, operate strongly through different domains, but they usually terminate in the politics of majoritarian state interventions, which attempt to regulate macaque presence and reduce human macaque conflict in urban areas. In many uh, Indian cities, for example, there have been widespread moves to translocate and rehabilitate rhesus monkeys from the urban to the rural commons, a strategy that has been the center at the center of all state responses to the urban monkey menace. And why translocation is not a good idea at all is something we should perhaps discuss after this. But let me tell you that much of this shifts the problem of the monkeys to someone else. We don't really solve the problem in any way. There is no durable solution, as was exemplified by the Asola Bhatti sanctuary on the outskirts of Delhi. Many of you who may have been to Delhi or may have seen Asola Bhatti know that the sanctuary was set up to relocate the urban rhesus macaques there. But today, the villages around Asola Bhatti are completely tormented by the huge number of macaques which have now spilled over from the sanctuary. So this really is absolutely no solution. We argue that each resolve to relocate macaques is reflective of a wider trend in India where problem urban macaques are translocated down the Indian socio-political hierarchy with troops being caught in cities, being moved to the villages, and uh, first to the suburbs, from the suburbs to the villages, and from the villages, their further trapping and relocation to rural and forested hinterlands. When you consider territorialization as a solely human activity, which is what we look at when we translocate, we also overlook how Jennifer Walsh has put it, animals themselves are critical to the making of places and landscapes. How do animals transform and take away the environment for their own, or in other words, how are animal spaces decided upon by people slowly but gently being replaced by beastly places that non-humans themselves establish? We've seen this with the stray dog, right? And many people complain about how the, the entire streets are being taken over by groups of dogs. So these are animals who are making space for themselves, right? So we believe that that it is a productive area for future interdisciplinary discussions if we examine synerbization as a continuous de- and re-territorialization of space through modes of composition and movement between people and macaques. This would perhaps enable a more sophisticated analysis of urban ecologies and potentially generate new ways of thinking about the future in contexts where macaques and humans inhabit common worlds with shared histories. It's also important, I think, to a certain extent to remember that the macaques themselves are as affected by their encounters with people as we are. Our ecological and ethological work reveals how macaques differentiate, as I said earlier, between natural and human source foods. They alter their everyday rhythms, territories, and foraging strategies to gain access to the human origin foods. On days of the week, when on Tuesdays and Saturdays, large-scale provisioning takes place, Jesus macaques troops spend considerable time in the Hanuman temple to gain access to what is nutritionally rich food. These are quotidian rhythms forged through interactions with people and with considerable bearings on the animals' lives, for they can lead to the development of entire novel repertoires of behavior, and necessarily these uh, are not seen when human macaque interactions are missing. 
I would therefore like to end uh, my part of uh, this discussion, my presentation, uh, with an account of a most unexpected change in macaque human relationship, which has recently occurred in the forests of Bandipur. Individual macaques in one particular troop in the Bandipur forest camp has now begun to use a novel food requesting behavioral strategy, right? Which is a combination of a soft coo call with an arm outstretched. It's a new gesture where they outstretch their arms to actually directly communicate with food bearing tourists who visit the sanctuary. Right now, this is a multimodal communication strategy because it involves a gesture as well as a vocalization. And this usually results in food being thrown at the macaque. And this was never this behavior is never shown towards members of their own species, because typically amongst macaques, there is no food sharing, not even between mother and infant. Juvenile bonnet macaques who have begun to forage independently typically display this food requesting behavior, as they are obviously unable to practice the more aggressive food acquisition strategies of the adult macaques, given their small body size and general fear of humans. Right. So let me now uh, show you a small clip of um, a, a, a juvenile macaque. Uh, requesting food. Now, you may not be able to hear the coo call, but if you pay attention, you might be able to hear it. But you will see at two points how it extends its hand in a gesture of request for food. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, this unique soft coo call, which I don't know whether you heard, which is used by both female and juvenile macaques in several populations in different contexts, possibly serves to attract the attention of the human subjects during the interactions. Or if the coo call could be a signal to express the macaque's intent to acquire the food that is being held by the tourist, or it could even be a motivational signal. I don't know whether some of you have noticed that when a leopard or a cheetah hunts, it's absolutely still, but the tip of the tail twitches. And it's now believed that this twitching of the tail tip seems to motivate the animal, seems to remind the animal why it's there, it's hunting, right? And it could be the coo call is a motivational sort of behavior that allows the macaque to remember uh, what its mission at that point is. Right. However, what is more interesting is that the hand extension gesture, which you may have just noticed, appears to be produced only when the macaque is able to lock gaze with the particular human target. Until the human and the macaque are looking at each other directly, they will not extend their hand. And in order to lock gaze, they will move their bodies, they will follow the humans, they will orient themselves in different ways to meet the gaze of the the human target. Therefore, what makes this uh, human, uh, this communication system unique is that all these component gestures and the calls are performed intentionally. And in the case of the hand extension gesture, possibly referentially, it is referring to the food that the human being seems to be holding. And such a request, which clearly demonstrates the simple but a very powerful urge of a young hungry macaque to obtain a morsel of food, becomes reinforced and ritualized when positively rewarded for by their human beings. It is, after all, emotionally wrenching not to respond to this unusual human appeal. This successful behavioral strategy, possibly initiated by one or a few adventurous and innovative juvenile individuals, has now spread rapidly by processes of social learning across the major troops of the Bandipur camp. So here we are talking about culture. We are talking about behavioral traditions where all juvenile macaques across these group groups are now requesting food only when tourists carry food, not otherwise. 
And this has never been documented anywhere in any species of wild monkeys anywhere, right? But this particular kind of gestural and material exchange between human and non-human primates suggests possibly that the bonnet macaques are unparalleled in their social flexibility and adaptability that allows them to survive the most hostile of all environments. Certain individual macaques may thus be capable of developing, refining, and learning a fairly complex communicative strategy that allows them to negotiate with a potential adversary, a human being, a strategy that can be used directly, though perhaps without thinking in many cases, and at will, within their lifetimes. Let me then, uh, sorry, let me then leave you uh, by asking you to think about the nature of these various kinds of affective interactions that I have spoken to you about. Some of these relationships have perhaps emerged within the city, but some at specifically urbanizing once forested locations, natural cultural contact zones, where humans and non-humans have begun to encounter and relate to one another through specific exchanges of signals and materials. This gradually sunarbizing forests of Bandipur have thus become a fertile and a heterogeneous space where relationships between two phylogenetically related species are being improvised and ritualized with, within very unequal relations of power. We can also perhaps visualize how the possible emotionality of the individual actors engaged in this relational practice is leading to the co-creation of new forms of subjectivity, new forms of relationship within these changing spaces of interaction. And this is perhaps a feature we will, inter we will encounter more and more in the Anthropocene, in the current century, where non-humans are slowly moving into human habitations to establish their lives. The traditionally intimate and persistent presence of non-human primates and other species in our lives over centuries must then lead to the reimagination of our societies are not as not being exclusively human spaces, but nature, society, hybrids co-constituted through relations between people and animals. There nevertheless continues to be very little engagement with the growing synerbization of our wildlife populations, whereby various urbanizing influences, primarily human activities, have forced individual animals to adapt to these altered socioecologies for their very survival. How then do other sentient creatures negotiate and learn to inhabit complex, dynamic environments, comprehending them according to their own feelings, their own knowledges, their own speeds and rhythms. What bearings do our lives and our often unfeeling actions have on the life worlds of animals? And how can a comprehension of these shared life worlds contribute to a recasting of our own perspectives, prejudices and practices? Does then the fervent appeal of food with arms outstretched and that soft coo call that the bonnet macaques are showing embody their last desperate bid to cope with the loss of their habitats and their resources to a far more powerful species? Is it a final act of negotiation with a world that is quietly but surely slipping away from their grasp? I think we need to think about these issues. Thanks. Wonderful, yes. That was, uh, I, I should say, very insightful, but very evocative as well, because you, you spoke about a lot of, uh, you know, not only the issues that face the macaques, but also how, you know, how we are, we need to deal with them ourselves and we need to kind of introspect at our end, you know, what are, what, how are we going to, you know, uh, deal with this problem. So just picking on the threads that you, you had in your talk, the, yeah. the first one uh, that that is there, you know, historically and uh, from all the perspectives that we have grown up reading, the Panchatantra right. and the Jatakas, the, right. the monkeys or the macaques have been represented as very uh, intelligent, very right. at times naughty, smart, 
very right. caring if you see the right. monkey king in jataka yeah. or you you right. had the you know the different yes. tales the crocodile and the monkey they are the very right uh, the question arises and this is a most often uh, uh, you know uh, thing that has often been you know discussed and asked to you as well and you have spoken about it a lot as well you know the consciousness angle of how intelligent and conscious are these you know macaques per se and how do we how how do we judge them correct okay uh, so that's a very complicated uh, sort of set of questions uh, firstly yes turning to indian folklore indian uh, thinking uh, much of our depiction of non humans is of course based and that's what interests quite a few of us is how much are they based on natural observations of animals uh, let me tell you that the earliest reference that we find to a macaque presumably a bonnet macaque living in human habitation goes back 2000 years where in the tamil sangam poetry we have a poet muttamochiar who actually describes a macaque in the jackfruit tree in the town's commons uh, muttamochiar perhaps lived at in 100 bc or maybe 100 ad in that period but it's 2000 years ago so these animals have been living with us for very long periods of time and this has given opportunities to sculptors painters poets uh, other narrators to actually document their behavior and bring them into our folklore right or what we now call folklore on the other hand it's also interesting and this is particularly true for the non human primates given their phylogenetic closeness to us given the superficial similarity sometimes superficial of course sometimes deeper similarity in their behavioral patterns with us it, it i think it's important to ask whether we are then anthropomorphizing and imposing our what we consider ideal or less than ideal are we imposing them on animals because then it gives us a vehicle to communicate with other humans about how one should be so are we then using animals in some sense to carry forward our own narratives our own beliefs our own ideals our own ethics is an interesting question the second set of question that you asked is about cognition is about intelligence is about consciousness and this is of course a difficult uh, question and perhaps we should have a separate discussion on this but it is true that even consciousness is not a very um, it's an umbrella term it actually encompasses a whole range of behaviors a whole range of cognitive capacities that individuals are capable of right and if you look at the continuum from non humans into humans you will see not only across groups of species or even across individuals a great variety in how they are able to use some of these mental processes right this changes across in evolution it changes across groups and therefore you have to ask whether a particular task which you consider reflective of a certain kind of intelligence can it be performed by a certain species or by a certain individual at all so if you look at memory for example or if you look at certain other abilities non humans perhaps have far many many non humans have far greater capacities than humans have on the other hand no monkey has ever built a computer or gone to the moon right on the other hand if there is radioactive fallout if there's a nuclear war the cockroach and this is oft said and i think it's true the cockroach will be the last to go we will go far far before many of these other species right in tsunamis for example in the famous tsunami of in famous tsunami of 2004 as far as we know many humans lost their lives very few macaques died they were clearly able to sense a change and they it is said that all of them moved inland right so clearly you know we know of ants for example who start moving their larvae they start moving the eggs they start relocating when dark clouds gather in the horizon perhaps they sense a change in humidity right would you call that intelligence would you call that just a bodily function and if it's the latter then why are not some of our own capacities also bodily functions that we have evolved in the kind of environments we live in but perhaps given time macaques or other species would also evolve not to this extent but in other directions that would enable them to adapt after all can you even imagine a macaque coming to you 
locking gaze with you and once it sees that you have food to give a call and put out a hand she never does this with any of her own species she has learned to do it only with humans right and this is adaptability it's an extremely important uh, so so i think we need to broaden our horizons and stop being judgmental about what we are capable of and what they are capable of or incapable of in some sense of the term and try and understand how each individual is adapted to its own environment and therefore has evolved all the capacities that are necessary for it to survive in that environment the amoeba is perhaps one of the oldest organisms on the planet but it has such a simple lifestyle right all it does is swim along and gulp food and yet if you drop a, a drop of acid in its path, it will stop. It will sense out a pseudopodium, sense the acid, withdraw the pseudopodium, and swim in the opposite direction. According to certain philosophers, this is consciousness. You sense a stimulus in the environment, and you process that information, and you know appropriately how to respond to that stimulus. Isn't that what we do in our intelligent behavior all the time? So I think, therefore, uh, we need to really understand intelligence, consciousness, cognition in very different ways and stop categorizing them. I think it's a continuum and each executive function has to be defined in its own way. Sorry, that was a very long answer. No, no, that, that's perfect. So now let me let me just uh, turn the tables on this question. Uh, sure. The study of macaques and primates, what can we humans learn about ourselves? You know, what, what is the things that we can learn about our own species, about our own evolution from that matter? <laughs> Adaptability. The ability to change social formations. So much has been written about the breakdown of the uh, the joint family system, right, in human communities. And it's always been looked upon in such a negative light because many of the values that the joint family system held seems to have gone. If you look at the Bandipur macaques over the last 20 years, what we have documented is that the tourists providing food to the macaques has led to a complete change in their social organization, right? So from being multi-male, multi-female groups, females have started competing over these human foods to such an extent that to bring down the tension in their groups, they are now separating into smaller groups. And when they break up into permanent smaller groups, they are taken over by a single male. And so from a multi-male, multi-female social organization in some 20, 30 years, we now see the origin of a new form of social organization, which is unimale, one male with several females. It's really parallels in some sense the breaking down of our joint family system. And the reason is the same. It's a competition for resources, right? If the joint family system possibly broke down because people were quarreling over who should contribute more, who should contribute less. Do we help those who are disadvantaged or do we then just decide to move away because we want to keep everything for ourselves? And that's exactly the kind of decisions the macaques are making, except at a much more basic level. Right. So I think it's very difficult to answer your question, except that the adaptability, you know, today we know of a tiger, uh, which, you know, we've always believed that a, no tiger would ever be able to survive human contact. And it's true that they are being affected. Yet we have now documented tigers who have walked 300 kilometers from Karnataka into Maharashtra. And mind you, the tigers have not used only forested tracks. They have gone right along roads. They have skirted villages and towns, and they have made their way to another forest patch. This remarkable adaptability is something that we are now discovering. And I think at some level, what we need to learn from them is how to adapt to changing situations and perhaps not regret the changes that come in but also recognize that we are the cause. And that's something that they don't recognize. They do recognize that humans are a source of food. Humans are a source of threat. But I think what we fail to recognize how we ourselves are a threat to humans themselves, right? In so many ways, either as groups or as individuals or as whole entire populations, we are threatening ourselves. We are threatening our own survival. And this is something we don't seem to have learned at all 
from animals, right? Okay. Yeah. So one one of the things that comes to mind is more often than not, we club, you know, we talk about the macaques as monkeys and we talk about them as a species. Hmm. But each of them are individuals and they have their own personalities, right? Yes. And I've seen you you talk very you know passionately about the subject where you say so if you can just give a brief uh, description about where how their personalities are how how do they <laughs> okay so again that's a very complex question Shashwat and I won't be able to do justice to it but let me just say this much that each individual animal is precisely that an individual animal and it's either because we don't care. We don't have the time or the energy or the intention that we've never tried to look at the variability across individuals, right? Uh, we think if you've seen one monkey, you've seen them all. And now, and you mentioned the Bandipur project, which is now in its 21st year, and we've now identified by face more than 2,000 individuals. And let me tell you, just as we can identify them as unique individuals on the basis of their face, facial or morphological features, their behavioral profiles are all different. No two macaques in Bandipur are identical in the way they lead their lives, the way they interact with other individuals within their group, the way, the way they interact with other members of other species as well. Right. And so this uniqueness is what we have missed out in traditional zoological thinking. And it's something that we need to understand. Now, just to give an example, do you know that if you look at aggression in cockroaches, there's a remarkable amount of individual variability right, across cockroaches in their aggression. And now molecular biology, using molecular biological techniques, we have identified three genes which are responsible for aggression. And many of these, therefore, are inherited. So if you take cockroach males, they are likely to be as aggressive as their fathers, even though they've never met them ever before. So there's a genetics to it, right? And I think this is true for humans as well. Though much of our individuality is shaped by our environment right from the time we are born, or maybe even in the mother's womb, right till we die, there are also genetic elements that determine many of our cognitive abilities, that many of our uh, human temperaments, many of our personality features. And somehow we've either not looked at them because of the lack of proper scientific methodologies to analyze them completely without making it very subjective, or in some cases, we do not want to look at it. Now, this may be a rightful political agenda where we want to cover up individuality because we we want to believe that everybody is the same but everybody is not the same right we are all very different it doesn't need to have a value associated of being superior or inferior good or bad or right or wrong it's just that we are different and i think when i study the macaques that's what i recognize because there are no ethical judgments that come along i look at them as non-humans and therefore i'm perfectly accepting of all the variability that exists across each of these individuals. Somehow we've not been able to do that with humans. Oh, wonderful. Okay, I had, uh, I had. if you can just briefly, the, the Bandipur project itself, over right. 20 years now, two decades, if, you, if you, you have been observing them at close quarters and you have, you have chosen to observe them in the wild, which you preferred over them you know, sitting in a lab and doing that. Right. Have you been accepted as part of their troop for, for that matter? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, that's a very important question. It has also a negative side to it, which I'll come to. Uh, one of the primary steps in any of these studies is what is called habituation. So you get the macaques used to you or you get any animal group that you're studying or even with people. Even if you want to study a human community, you need to get to a stage where they don't treat you as an outsider because then their behavior changes every time you're there. So for the macaques, I would like them to consider me as a rock or a tree or just someone, doesn't matter who, but as long as I don't affect their lives, they are fine with me, right? So, so, so this is the, what is called habituation. And I do know now that many of these troops, many of these individuals recognize me as an individual. And I can also tell an anecdote that 
before I grew my beard, those who interacted with me took a little more time once I grew my beard, but they still recognize me. And in fact, there have been parallel studies on baboons in the laboratory, which have shown that they identify individual faces, not only of other baboons, but of humans as well. And these have been done in come with computer generated images. They recognize human faces through the eyes. So if you change all the features of a human face, but keep the eyes constant, they still know it's the same individual. And that I think is remarkable, right? Michelangelo said that the, the, that the eyes are the mirrors of the soul, right? So therefore, I think they know exactly uh, who the individual is. And in many cases, they may tolerate me, but they will not tolerate others. There are also juveniles who interact with me, but which I prevent uh, because I do not want to be a part of them as a part of my objective study. So, um, so yes, so that is an important, but the negative aspect of it is, uh, and this is an important ethical question, and this is true for any study, is how have I changed their lives by studying them, by being with them? If by being with them, they have lost their fear of me, will they then lose their fear of other humans next? If they do, Will they attack someone else who doesn't know exactly how to behave when they are with a macaque, right? So, so these ethical questions will always remain. And I'm always asked this by students. And I don't have a simple answer to it. I decided to study macaques. And if I've made a mistake, I've made a mistake. But I need to acknowledge it now. Yes. But, but Rana, and the fact of the matter is, uh, while you might have changed the macaques, and we are not sure about that, the macaques have definitely changed you in many ways, right? <laughs> I guess so. Yes. Yeah. So just keeping that in mind, you, there are numerous studies which are done of the great apes and everything. The, the primary reason, the driving force behind most of these studies and in wildlife is the number, the extinction, right? If you are on the extinction list and uh, the color yeah. code kind of defines the importance in the hierarchy. Right. The macaques, uh, unfortunately, are, you know, not, not, they, and fortunately or unfortunately, I shouldn't say that. They're right. not there on the list. So their study is not considered important per se. What yeah. To that thing? Yeah. So unfortunately, you're asking the question to a wrong person, right? I study bonnet macaques. Of course, as Dr. Meva Singh, who's one of my mentors um, and a remarkable man who has studied primates all his life, will tell you bonnet macaques are threatened as well. It's just that we don't care, right? We don't care. Uh, it's, just, it's just a pest monkey. It's another monkey. How does it matter whether it lives or dies? But they are on their way out. Having said that, Yes, you're right. That's one motivation to study many non-human species is to find ways in which we can conserve them, in which way we can protect them, make sure they don't go extinct. But I think there is something else as well. And that is what is important for me. It's just to know, just to know how the others live, right? What are their aspirations? What are their lifestyles? What is it that they're expecting out of every day? Right. And it's important to know that. And the reason why I think I would like to know that is also because in a way it will then regulate how I interact with them. Right. So an important reason and I always use this as a justification to study cognition, because one of my primary uh, study area is to understand the evolution of the non-human mind. And I think there one important justification is that the more we understand the other mind, the more we are likely to question our own behavior towards them, our own relationship with them. And I think, you know, a lot of people will say, ah, you know, I don't mind killing a fish because a fish doesn't feel pain. True. I don't know whether a fish pain, feels pain or not. That's a moot point. But if I told you that the fish does feel pain, would you change your behavior? You, we might still, I mean, I'm a non-vegetarian. I still continue to eat meat and fish. But is there a subtle difference in the way we treat even these animals that we hunt down for food. I, whether that's important or not, I think depends on every individual and whether how they will look at it. And there is no, again, and that's one thing I've learned from animals. There is no good, there's no bad, there's no right, there's no wrong. It's just there, right? And whether you accept it or not, or whether you reject it is really up to you. There are no general prescriptions that can regulate these uh, interactions, these behaviors, these relationships, they all take their own course. But to a certain extent, I think it's important to understand the other individual. 
I think that that's because we are social and we need to perhaps understand that. Yeah. And, you know, just just a small note to the viewers, uh, we will be taking, uh, I mean, they will be taking a couple of questions towards the end. I, I'm, we are moving towards that and I'm, I'm definitely, I'm sure a lot of questions are there in your mind. You can post them here. You know, this, this the changing dynamics of the nature, uh, Ananda, between uh, macaques and us, you know, we, mm. you have briefly touched upon it, you know, from okay. studying on nature in our cities to urbanization of nature per se. Right. right. How should this? How should we imagine the cities? We I remember you speaking somewhere talking about theory of zoopolis, right? Right. If you can just you know touch upon that and just give your your thoughts. Okay. See, I don't know. This is again too vast uh, a thinking, and I think as I said, I think what I respect most about uh, individuals, whether they are human or non-human, is that each individual has a unique way of thinking, of behaving, of acting, of reacting, of responding, right? And I think each of them are equally important. I may follow certain practices in my own life, but I think each individual is free to decide how they want to live. And perhaps the important uh, point there is, can we not harm others or how can we not hurt others as much as possible? Of course, even this is a utopian ideal. We can't always reach there. But I think if, as Gandhiji said, you know, Gandhiji was once asked that you believe in nonviolence, but I'm sure you kill so many insects on your way, right? And he smiled and he said, yes, but it was not my intention to kill. It, if accidentally that happens, at least my conscience is clear that I did not want to kill it. And if I can help it, I will. That was his logic. And I think that's one way of looking at it, right? I mean, what is vegetarianism? It's also killing plants, right? So, and why are, why are animals more sacrosanct than plants, right? Because they don't scream, because uh, plants uh, are not able to weep or tell you, please spare my life. Is that the only reason? So I think philosophically, this argument can go on, but it's not important. Coming back to what you asked, I think we are entering a phase where we will be forced to think of coexistence within the city, wherever, just as we want a forest patch not to be affected. I think we also need to understand how every species in our own city around us needs to survive, needs to live. Right now, I know there will be conflict of interests and there will be killing and there will be deaths. But I think it's more about the attitude and the perspective that we develop, where we know that we cannot remove all elephants, we cannot remove all tigers, not that we want to, we can never remove all pigeons, we can never remove all cockroaches, we can never remove all monkeys. Singapore did try to remove all pigeons and they failed. They may have managed to remove the stray dog. Europe is free of stray dogs, sure. But now the foxes are taking over. The gulls are taking over. So will now Britain think of culling all foxes as they did of dogs because it's interfering with their lives? Will they cull all gulls because they are taking the place of the stray dog that Victorian England removed? So these are questions I think we need to ask. Where do you draw a line? Where do you end? And I think, therefore, our work on urban ecology is trying to understand uh, how we can coexist. And in fact, I think I will just quickly refer to um, a question asked here uh, by Prakhar, Prakhar Manas, who's a, a friend of mine. And Prakhar asks that we see an interesting observation. He's a parallel is the discriminatory practices that cities show towards the economically underprivileged and these macaques. Do you think this discrimination is a feature of the city? No, Prakhar. It's not a feature of the city. It's a feature of humans everywhere, right? And I think we see it more in the city because we are constrained for space. We are constrained for resources. Uh, we meet a lot of difficulties in our every day. And therefore, we are not able to maintain our equable behavior. We start discriminating. We want to see how we can draw an advantage to ourselves. And that's what urbanization has unfortunately brought in. Right. And when that happens, you're absolutely right. Whether it's the dog or whether it's the Dalit, someone becomes the untouchable. Right. And in fact, uh, one of uh, my uh, doctoral students, Sneha Gudgutia, is looking at this. She's actually looking at communities who have pigs. Right. And you can see just, her work is mainly on urban precarity. And what you then see is that just as the life of the pig or the dog is filled with precarity, 
so is it with many of our marginalized socially, politically, uh, economically marginalized sections of our society. And therefore, it's fascinating. If you look at any of the homeless people, whether in London or in Delhi, you will see many of them have a dog or a cat with them. Right. And I think it's incredible. I've seen how many people who are homeless, who don't have resources, will share whatever little they have with the dog who's with them. I I'm sure many of you have seen this. What does it mean? I think species boundaries have dissolved. I think what is important is the condition of suffering, the condition of want, the condition of desire, the condition of sharing. And there it doesn't matter whether you're sharing with a fellow human being in your family or with a dog who's perhaps your only family at that point. In fact, in an earlier study that we did in Chennai, the people who were most against street dogs were people who lived in high rises. And this is just to give an example where they would not tolerate a dog even within their campus. In fact, they were waiting for the last few families for their dogs to die because the rule in that complex is that no pet dog would be allowed subsequently. If, however, you go to the fishing community, you go to the so-called informal settlements in Chennai, most of them will say that rabies Yes, some of us have had rabies. And if we see a dog that is rabid, we inform the authorities and they remove it. But is that a reason to remove all the dogs? So to come back to Prakar's question, just as there may be discrimination against socioeconomically uh, uh, challenged people, as well as towards animals, there is also a sense of kinship that develops across certain individuals and the non-human members of their community or of their family, which I think surpasses, overcomes this, uh, this uh, discrimination as well. And that is why I think it's important to look at the individual. It's not just about how a community reacts. It's also how individuals within the community react. And unfortunately, some voices are stronger than others, which yeah. is why it's people are heard. Right. Yeah, just picking on that point, there are some questions related to us as well. The Madaris, right? What is your right. views on these Madaris who, 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 you know, kind of have these domesticated monkeys and train them, right. but they also care and share with them for them? Of course. Not... Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, I think uh, Dinesh Ji has asked a question there. When Madaris domesticate monkeys, is it good or bad? And I'm sure Dinesh Ji will agree with me that there is no good or bad. There is no right or wrong. There is no black or white. Right. It really depends on the individual perspective, on the individual attitude, on the individual behavior. Right. So while the Madaris are extremely caring of their individual macaques as well, and that could be either because of the bonding that develops between them or more practically, because that's the source of livelihood. So they have to take care of the monkeys anyway. People can now question, should they have been domesticated in the first place? Of course, one point is that the macaques are not domesticated, right? They are the urban wild, unlike the dogs or the pigs or um, such cows, which have been domesticated and are now in some sense completely dependent on humans, macaques or kites or many of these other species or the foxes of Britain are actually still wild. It's just that they are dependent on urban resources. They live in the city. That's what makes them perhaps commensal and perhaps gives them uh, give you an idea that they are a part of us. They are not. They're just leading parallel lives. It's just that their resources overlap with those of ours. And therefore, to come back to it, and this is a question people are asking about elephants, the relationship between mahouts and elephants, is that a power? There is also affection, but it's also a power. The Mahut knows that at any point of time, the elephant can turn around and kill him. So he needs to be careful. But then isn't a parent offspring relationship also that of power? Aren't relationships between human spouses that of power as well? So I think it's just that we have to look at it in a slightly broader terms, as I was mentioning earlier, look at it as a continuum. And then you will see that what you define as good or bad really depends on what you deeply believe in, what you would like to do, what you would like to see the other individual as. And that's when the good and bad concepts come up and we have to resolve it ourselves. So there is no blanket way of saying this is good or this is bad. I think it really depends on what each individual gets out of it. Not only the individuals in that relationship, but the outsiders, 
the people looking into it as well. Okay. We often come across, you, you touched upon the elephant and the Mahot example. We come across right. these videos of it, the, on the death of the Mahot, the elephant has been, you know, kind of emotional. And similarly for monkeys and langurs, you keep keep you, you, you seeing those videos, oftentimes right. viral yeah. videos. Are they capable of emotions like that? <sighs> it's a question we don't know an answer to, right? So, uh, see, as a hardcore biologist, uh, trained in the Western scientific method, I cannot really define emotions, right? And and I'll tell you, it's it's uh, it's very difficult, right? It's what in consciousness studies is called qualia. So if you come to a movie theater with me, um, and you will see that in every movie I cry, right? But the reason I cry, or the stimulus that makes me cry, and crying is just a phenotype, right? That there are tears streaming down my eyes, and I'm sniffling, and I'm using my handkerchief. That's all you see. What causes the tears to flow? And I can tell you that in no two cases would there be an identical stimuli that makes me weep, right? In some cases, it's happiness. It's, it's this joy that makes me weep, right? So can I, therefore, if you watch me and I don't talk to you, will you ever know why I am weeping? And that's the problem also with non-humans. Because we cannot talk to them, because they cannot talk to us, we do not know what is the emotion that they are experiencing, if at all they are. We do not know whether they can think. I know, I know many of our audience right now are getting thoroughly bored with this discussion. And they know that they're getting bored. Do animals know what they are thinking? Do animals know what they want? And I'll tell you that this is a methodological problem. If you stay one week with me, Shashwat, and we don't talk to each other even once, you will not know whether I can think or not. Many of the problems I will solve that you will see me solve can be explained by very simple mechanisms. You don't need to bring in consciousness at all. If you see me sleepwalking, I'm not conscious. Right? Many uh, blind sight. In blind sight, people lose some of their higher uh, capacities and they do not know that they can see, but they are seeing. A blind sight person will walk through a room full of furniture, not hit even a single one. But when you ask the person, and these are experiment, products of experiments, when you ask the person, how did you walk if you can't see, he will say or she will say, I don't know. I guessed my way through. But they can see, but they don't know they can see. And this ability to, your ability to know whether I know what I'm thinking of only comes through conversation. If you don't talk to me, you will never. So therefore, I think a lot of these prejudices come in Right? Yeah. A deaf mute person. How would you know what a deaf mute person is actually thinking? Even with autism, do we really understand what is going on through the mind of an autistic child? We don't because they, we cannot communicate with them. And therefore, a lot of our prejudices come in because of a lack of understanding. And I think, therefore, come, coming back to what you just said, how do I even surmise what is the emotion that's running through you right now? Right? I must give, it, give you benefit of doubt and feel that if you have emotions, I must respect that. But I will never know whether you are emotional or not. Wonderful, wonderful. And I have a couple of questions, but before I, I, I it will be more justice to take up the viewer questions per se first. Yeah. yeah. So, sure. Uh, so I, I'm just going down uh, the list. And uh, I think Lata Avasti. She asks how to manage urban macaque population and its aggressive behavior leading to human animal conflict. <sighs> we don't know. But having said that, one, I can tell you some rules of the thumb. First, don't feed animals, right? Don't feed animals. I know that you might feel good if you feed them, but it's not always good. It's like you go to the zoo and they say you don't feed the zoo animals, they tell you. It's true here as well, because when you feed, that monkey, maybe yes, that hunger is being met, but that emboldens the monkey to become aggressive. And the next person who will not offer food may get bitten. So your actions can have long term repercussions. So, and this is a government rule, by the way. However much we may think punya comes from feeding animals, it's against the government rule to feed wild animals, and monkeys are wild animals. Number one. Number two, 
do some simple things. Keep wire netting on your doors and windows. Make sure that all rooms are secured when you're not in the room. Don't keep, if there are monkeys in the area, don't keep food on your table, right? Keep your windows shut when you're not there, right? So, so or if you come face to face with a monkey, just look away and gently walk away. Don't run, but don't provoke it. Throwing a stone at the macaque can never drive it away. It will only provoke it to perhaps attack you subsequently or attack someone else subsequently, right? So I think there are some, uh, some of the simple rules I followed was I would never look at them in the eye when they were looking at me. So I'm looking at a monkey trying to note down its behavior. But when it looks at me, I look away. Because when I look away, I'm not a challenge. I'm not interested in you. I'm looking at something else. And you know, this is exactly the suggestion people give to New York subway travelers, especially women when they're traveling late in the night and there is one another male and you're a little afraid, the first thing they suggest is read a book. Don't look at that individual in the eye because I think the eye is also reflects a lot of what you're feeling, what your thoughts are. And that becomes very evident right, to the other individual. It's true for the macaques as well. So I, I always sit with them because if I'm at their height, I'm less of a threat to them than when I'm standing and towering over them. So there are some basic behaviors that I think all of us can learn, which prevents macaques from attacking us, but prevent them having access to resources. I think that's important. Of course, if you have flowering plants, you can't protect all of them and they will come. But once they realize that there is no food here, in many cases, they will slowly start moving away to other areas. Uh, but just one thing, this whole business of, uh, you know, uh, relocation, right uh, catching ah, yes. them yes. the Delhi government and all have spent crores and crores of rupees to you know, kind of relocate right. them uh, would that ever solve the problem no. and just one quick addendum to that uh, yeah. they also had these people dressed up in uh, langur suits yeah, yeah. They, uh, are macaques afraid of langurs per se no no they are not at all they are not at all. Yes, in North India, in Delhi, many of the langur uh, subspecies that we have are larger body size than the macaques and they are believed to threaten them and move them away. You come down to Bandipur, all the macaques routinely chase away the langurs if they are competing over food. So that's not it. But the more important question, Shashwat, and I would like to spend just a minute. I know we have crossed time, I think, but I'm fine continuing, uh, is that Translocation is really transferring the problem to someone else. These are macaques which are used to people. So they will go to the nearest human habitation. And as I said, that we are working down the social hierarchy. Those who have the strongest voice, who live in the affluent parts of the city, will get their macaques moved to the suburbs. And if the suburbs do have a manage to have a voice, they will get a truckload of macaques to be moved to the village further down. And it just moves down the human social hierarchy, frankly. But looking at it from the point of view of the macaques, what problem are you going to solve for them? You're disrupting their family structure. You're perhaps making them more aggressive. Uh, and please realize that the moment those macaques go, other macaques will come and take their place. It's exactly like the street dogs, which is why the sterilization uh, uh, processes of sterilization have brought in. It has its own ethical issues. But leaving aside that, the belief is that when you have dogs in an area sterilized, they will not multiply anymore, but they will keep out other dogs. So the population won't go up. Of course, once they die, other dogs will come and take their place because you can't have 100% sterilized dogs in a, any city. It's true for macaques as well. Sterilization attempts are on. People have not studied what effect it does. But even if you say we humans are superior and we can do anything we want with the macaques, let's sterilize them so that their numbers don't grow. Please remember that you will have to sterilize every single female macaque. Male sterilization does not work. Because even one non-sterilized male can potentially fertile, uh, potentially fertilize all the females. So you have to sterilize every single female. Will that work? Will culling work? How many people have protested? And I will tell you this, that a few years ago, uh, the government of India agreed to three species, the Nilgai, the rhesus macaque, and the wild pig being killed if you had to defend your crops, if you had to defend your agricultural fields, you'd be astounded at how few animals were actually killed. 
And that takes me back to what I started off with, that inherently people have a deep respect for animals. It is true that when their resources are threatened, they want to keep those animals out. And sometimes you may even kill them. Fair enough. Fair enough. But deep down, I think there is a feeling that we need to coexist. It's just that I don't want to lose my resources. I don't want to lose my livelihood. I don't want to be bitten. I don't want to lose my child to an elephant, to a trampling elephant. Of course, of course. But at some level, how do you prevent this is perhaps only through changes, not only in your own behavior, but across the population, across the society. You know, I sorry, Shashwat, I'm going on and on. Uh, I went to a school where I gave a talk and a young girl asked me, sir, what do you think is the greatest problem with humans? Right. And I was stunned because I've never thought of it that way. And I, and I had to give her an answer because she was very expected. And I said, maybe it's this inability to say this much and no more. <laughs> OK, that, that's, very, that's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I think if we were able to say that, I think we would be able to solve, I think, a lot of problems. Yeah. Take a quick question from uh, yeah, Prasad yeah. Acharya. Yeah. Sorry, I'm running out of time. Uh, she asks, do you think the gesture that the Bandipur macaques have developed might be a result of attempting to mimic some similar human gesture for requesting food? Fantastic question. We've often thought about it. We don't really know. However, uh, there are simpler mechanisms. So, for example, uh, what we speculate is that a macaque might be reaching out for food, not able to get it. But the reaching out by a juvenile macaque can be an emotional stimulus for people to throw food. And the moment you receive food by Pavlovian learning over time, you know that if you stretch your food, a hand, you might get food. But what is fascinating is that they do it with the upturned palm, right, which is so human like. And this could be a result of trial and error as well. Some macaques did it this way. Some macaques did it this way. Those who did it this way perhaps received more food. And so they kept that practice on. And other macaques have clearly learned by watching others. There is definitely social uh, passing down, the social learning and the transmission of this behavior. So it's now a culture. It's a cultural tradition in the macaques. But whether the original innovators learned by watching humans, I really don't know. I would think it's unlikely because the each individual to see that in a human and remember it and learn it and then practice it seems less likely than some of these other learning mechanisms which have been well established by now. Yes, there's one. Vishwanath. Yes, uh, Vishwanath uh, Rijal, I think, asks, uh, have you noticed any symbiotic relationship between urban monkeys and street dogs and also with birds, pigeons and crows? I do know that they respond, and this is true in the forests as well, but also in the cities, uh, they do respond to each other's alarm calls, right? And uh, this, and I know uh, in the forest, many of you may know that langurs tend to often move with cheetal, the spotted deer, and they move together and the fruits that the langur drops is fed upon by the cheetal, so they learn that way. Uh, but it's also believed that the cheetal, when they respond, to a predator also alarms the langur. So clearly, this is not really symbiotic in that sense. But again, symbiosis is a very big word. However, it is true that there are learnings from each other. They respond to each other's calls. They respond to each other's behaviors, perhaps. But uh, while there may be individual friendships, like of the kind I described between humans and macaques, I've not really seen it except in captivity in domestic. I mean, I've had dogs and cats who played with each other. Uh, we know of cases where dogs have suckled cats and vice versa. But uh, other than those in the na natural environment, um, either in the forests or in the cities, I've never seen one on one uh, symbiotic relationships to the extent where they are truly dependent on each other. I haven't mm -hmm. seen that. There's a so final one or two questions is for you. There, there are a lot of students who are watching this, and I'm sure you know would be primatologists. I just wanted your take on the scope of this thing. You said in 2005 we are discovering a virtually new species, and we yes, the, no. The, the no, I think yeah, yeah. I think there is scope for everything. Any human enterprise has a scope uh, because there's always a niche that needs to be filled. 
I think the important question, Shashwat, we ask is what is it that we are looking out of life, right? So if you want, let's say, a high rise house and 10 cars, primatology may not be the right profession for you, right? On the other hand, if you want to learn about the monkeys and you want to learn about humans by learning about monkeys, you give up, of course, on having 10 cars and a house. Nobody can prevent you from doing it. Right. If you are convinced about what you would like to do, you can convince others. And so to all the students, let me tell you, be subversive. Don't listen to your parents. Don't listen to your peers. If they are asking you to do something that deep down you don't want to do. And for a good cause, you want to do something else. Because if you want to paint or you want to write poetry or you want to study monkeys, many parents may feel that you will starve to death. Let me assure you that if I haven't starved to death, neither will you. You must have that confidence in yourself that if you love doing something, you will do it well. And if you do it well, you will convince others that this is worth doing. And I, that's all I can say. I don't think any profession will end because each individual has very different interests and passions. And all I can say is feed your passions, follow them, follow them with hard work, follow them with conviction. And I think you can study whatever you like and you will never starve, I can assure you. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating because I'm sure when, when you chose monkeys over, you know, uh, after studying molecular biology, it must have been right. a shocker, especially for coming from a celebrated, uh, you know. Uh, oh, no, it was, it was a major shocker for my father. And that I can tell you. He was extremely di disappointed that I had given up molecular biology. And he said, look, everybody goes towards molecular biology uh, and you are moving away from it. And I think the only reason I moved away from it was because I didn't want to do molecular biology and I wanted to study monkeys <laughs> as simple as that. So, yeah. yeah. But then you, but you can convince them, right? At some point, I think at the end, my father was convinced that this is really what I wanted to do. And uh, so I think that's why your conviction and your passion is very important, because that allows you to maybe re let others respond and understand uh, what you yeah. want. And besides monkeys, which other species, I, I think, so uh, are you keen and interested and, in, you know, uh, you're obsessed with monkeys for sure, but which yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we've been studying elephants now I, with my students. Of course, when I say we've been studying, much of what I know comes from my colleagues, my collaborators, my students, because they do all the hard work, they get all the learnings, and I learn from them. Uh, but we, I, I think, the other philosophical point there, I think, is that any animal, any human, any any being is interesting when you go deep into it when you try and understand why someone is doing what it's doing. Otherwise, why are we still studying the amoeba and the bacteria, right? Clearly, these are simple unicellular organisms, and you would think we know everything about them. We still don't, right? And therefore, I think uh, anything is fascinating. Living, non-living, it depends on how you look at that object or you look at that being and what you discover in it that you'd like to know more about. I think that's all I will say there. Uh, there's a suddenly a question that's come from Shubhra Kanchan. And uh, uh, like dogs and cats who have body language, gestures like wagging tail to expressing happiness. I don't know whether they express happiness, but they do express something that they would like to continue to do. So that is definitely sure. Uh, uh, droopy ears for sorrow. I don't know whether it's sorrow, but it's definitely some kind of disappointment. Uh, uh, trying to make it value neutral. Do macaques also have expressions? Oh, of course they have. They have a whole range of expressions, gestures, postures. Uh, they use every part of their body to express uh, a certain intention. Let's keep it there. I won't call it in, in uh, emotion, but they do because you see much of what they are expressing is functional. So if a macaque is threatening me, uh, she's threatening me because she doesn't want me to be there. Right. It's not a question of whether she wants me to be there or doesn't want me to be there or whether she is afraid of me or not afraid of me. Functionally, as a scientist, I would say that if I move myself, she would not use that gesture, which is frightening me, I know my emotions, anymore. So I know how to respond to it. And therefore, I think every being, human or non-human, has different ways of expressing themselves 
Uh, and this varies across individuals. But the important thing is, can you make yourself clear to the other? person. In many cases, of course, humans are an exception because humans have gone into so much of deep thinking about their own state of existence that we have very different ways of looking at ourselves as at other humans. Possibly other non-humans don't have that kind of complexity in the way they treat themselves or they treat others. There's no doubt about that. But exactly how they treat themselves or others, how do they express themselves in every context is something we are very far from knowing. And we will perhaps never know, but they do express themselves. OK, I think so. We have more or less zero kind of uh, run over the time that sure. was there. I just fi a final two questions. One was, one was which was asked for me from someone from a mythology background. They, they were asking. So are, was the Vana Sena in the Ramayana a macaque or you know, apes? <laughs> OK, uh, so that's an interesting question. And you know, uh, one person uh, who um, spent some time thinking about this issue was Krishnan, right? And uh, Krishnan, a country notebook, remember Krishnan? And uh, he was a mentor to so many of us, who, many of us who uh, read Country Notebook and the Statesman when we were growing up was so inspired by his thinking. And uh, today, you know, I, I think for many of us, he's an icon, iconic figure. He has an essay called, Was Hanuman a Langur or a Makak? Right? And in that, he finally analyzes the iconography of uh, the depiction of Hanuman across North and South India and comes to the conclusion that Hanuman was modeled after a Makak not after a langur. The reason why the langur has become important is because of the story of Hanuman extinguishing the fire on his tail by slapping it on his face, which apparently is so similar to the dark face of the Hanuman langur or the gray langur. But other than that, Krishnan says that there is no further similarity between uh, the Hanuman and the langur. Right? That's his take. However, having said that, there is also an interpretation, and which is fascinating, of the Ramayana, which says that the Vanar Sena was actually an allegorical reference to other com human communities. Yeah. And, and I don't want to fall into the trap of asking whether this is an Aryan Dravidian divide, because we don't even know whether these communities or these so-called races at all exist in the way that we have mythologized them. However, it is said that, and this is what I referred to earlier, that sometimes when we want to get a message across to another human being, I use the vehicle of a non-human because then that's a neutral territory through which I can express what I want to convey to the other individual. And it could be that the Vanar Sena was actually a dig at certain other communities that this community looked down upon. Th there's an interpretation, right or yeah, wrong. True. True. You said you had another question. No, I had I had to. So, which are, which are your favorite uh, inspirations, models that you look uh, you know, kind of look up to? <sighs> okay, can I give you a very cliched answer <laughs> to this? Yes. I think every individual I meet, I admire for some quality or the other, something that I've never been able to achieve or able to aspire to, and I think therefore we learn from everyone around us. There are, of course, people I have admired for very different reasons. Um, so, you know, you mentioned Jane Goodall to me, of course. I mean, I think she's an iconic figure, if for nothing else, but for having brought chimpanzees to the center stage. It was like she is perhaps in the same mold as Rachel Carson, who through Silent Spring uh, brought to, to our attention how we have been destroying the environment. And I think Jane Goodall brings that to us. But there may be other people I've also admired in the course of my work. Um, and it's difficult to point that out. But again, and again, another cliche, but I think I've learned a lot from the Makats, at least the dispassionate, uh, to be dispassionate, to take in your stride, whatever comes your, along your way, I think is something that the Makats are very, very good at handling. Yeah, so that, that kind of brings us to the end of uh, the session today. It has been, the, I'm sure it has been of great learning, you know, personally for me, and I'm sure a lot of people out there. This one final thing, there, there's this famous song by Seamus Ken Kennedy, right? Uh, so, monkey farts do they smell of banana? <laughs> yeah. 
I know. But you know, I'll send you a little poem, which I don't know by heart, that reminded me um, is uh, of uh, an American poet called Ronald Court Gay, K O E R T G E. And uh, Ronald Court Gay uh, writes about uh, of monkeys. And he says that if you, I look at the suffering uh, of a monkey, I now realize that their lives goes beyond the banana and the tire that they're forced to play with in captivity. With on the, yeah, wonderful. So on that note, thank you so much uh, for your time. Uh, yeah, you know, Lana, for your amazing insight, uh, evocative insight. It's, it's also, you know, the, the way you summed up on that thing, I really li like your line where you said, you know, our monkeys too sentient to be animal, yet to other to be human. You know, yes. th this, this is a very, uh, you know, interesting point that we as, you know, not only as humans, but also as someone who have lived very closely with the monkeys per se, and we have our, our whole generation and our whole country has. Yeah, but, and the, but the main point, Shashwat, is that we'd have the same feelings towards other humans as well. We've not been able to get across those, right? We still divide on the basis of race or class or, or religion or uh, gender or sexual orientation. We dis we keep discriminating, we keep dividing. And uh, so I think the other continues to live within us. Yeah. And the only way I think so we can resolve that is by understanding and, you know, knowing the other, right? And this is Absolutely. your Absolutely. work is instrumental in, uh, in you know, doing that. Your work has been through your work, your talk today. I'm sure a lot of us, you know, for us, macaques have been just a bunch of monkeys, most most of the people. But now I'm sure a lot of people understand that the macaques are not merely just another species that, you know, prance around or a pest per se. But they are they are, they are individual themselves. And for that understanding and for that learning, I really thank you for your time and for your effort. And it's been a great pleasure talking to you. And I'm sure it was for everyone else. And on that note, I would like to take your leave. Thank you so much. Anand. Thank you very much, Ashwat. And thank you, Azim Prem University, for inviting me. Thank you, everyone. And we hope to meet you next month, possibly talking about some other interesting species that we have. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. Bye.